This is a Channel 11 News special. Avalanche, disaster on Stevens Pass. Every winter in the Cascades, a blanket of snow covers the forest. It also hides one of the most dramatic pieces of Washington history that's largely forgotten. This snowfall is a mere brushing compared to the winter 86 years ago. Back in 1910, snow drifts as high as 20 feet virtually covered a town called Wellington, just west of Stevens Pass. It was a railroad town built there as the new tunnel was driven through the pass. But it also became the site of the worst avalanche disaster in U.S. history. 96 people died as two trains were buried by snow. Tonight, you'll learn about that avalanche and the story of the town of Wellington, a town that no longer exists. At 4,000 feet in Stevens Pass, history can be as thin as the air. What's seen cutting through the mountains today reveals only a flicker of its relative past. People who live through something don't regard it as history ordinarily. They think that's just something that happened, nobody else is interested. Well, you know, when I come in here, there's a lot of times when I feel like I'm not alone. And some people think that's kind of crazy. Bob Kelly's interest has made him a regular on this pass for four years. And right now, we're entering a section of this road that is exactly on top of the old main line. Just below present-day Highway 2, short of Stevens Pass, lies the remains of the first railroad highway. This was Wellington, Washington in 1910, a rail town built to service the trains exiting the west end of the newly completed Cascade Tunnel. During one of the worst snowstorms in memory, over 100 people were stranded for nearly seven days at the pass, and on March 1st, an avalanche in Wellington plowed two trains into the canyon below, killing 96. Now, one thing we have to remember is, though, that there was no history of a snow slide or avalanche at this location. The most prominent feature left today is a concrete snow shed built on the site of the accident the following year. Does the fact this shed is here now strike you as ironic? Well, it certainly does. If it had been here at the time, of course, we wouldn't have the, would have had the disaster. I mean, there would not have been 96 people killed. They didn't actually need lanterns to do the first rescues. There was so much lightning. And this is the railroad main line, comes along, around through Wellington. Around Kelly, a longtime Boeing employee, has no family or direct connection with the accident in Wellington. But now he tells the tale to schools and other groups as the unofficial historian. All started from a hobbyist's interest in railroads. His home is now loaded with documents, pictures, and interviews on Wellington. And I started being allowed to look into family albums. Uh, seeing the people who died and, and, you know, the hopes and dreams they had when you look in their eyes. I'll never forget my interview with uh, uh, Charlie Andrews, who saw the slide come down. Ruby L. Holt wrote the first book on the disaster in 1960, 50 years after it happened. She typed some of the first interviews with the survivors and the families of those killed. It must have just been terrible to be on, confined on those trains and you know that you're in danger and there's no way out and it keeps snowing and snowing. The sounds of the town may be washed away, but for Bob Kelly, there's still plenty to hear. Looking down the side of the accident, Kelly envisions a memorial that could soon be here. I'll probably be thinking of those 96 people. Thinking of Ned Topping, and those guys that uh, were just innocent passengers trying to get to Seattle to do some business and ended their life here. After the accident, the name Wellington became synonymous with disaster. In fact, the fear was so strong that some rail passengers refused to go on routes with Wellington on the time schedule. So the Great Northern Railroad changed the name of the town. They called the station Ty, while mail was still delivered to Wellington. Now, the town survived until 1929 when the new Cascade Tunnel was built, about 1,000 feet below the old one.
Today's trains still run through this tunnel, but today's families still remember yesterday's disaster. <laughs> The opening of the first Cascade Tunnel through Stevens Pass was reason for celebration. For the first time, trains avoided the maze of switchbacks over the top of the pass, delivering them straight into the town of Wellington. Snow slides, however, were not eliminated. But handling slides was the pride of great northern crews based in Wellington. With their fan-like rotaries, they constantly cleared the tracks, forming 13-foot cocoons to pass through. And their efforts routinely kept the trains on schedule. Well, my father was a locomotive engineer. John Andrews was born in this town in 1922, 12 years after his father, Charlie, was the only witness to one of the country's worst disasters. One or two o'clock in the morning, why, he heard the Chinook wind blow in with uh, lightning and thunder, and he went out to see what was going on, and he said in the lightning flashes, he could see the whole side of the mountain start to slip picked up the two trains and everything went into the canyon. A passenger train and a mail train were smashed like kindling. Both had been stranded for five days in one of the worst storms where slides came down upon slides. He said it was kind of horrendous, especially when they were bringing the bodies out. Well before chainsaws, rescue work was with axes, crowbars, and picks to get through the packed snow. He said they would look for trickles of blood in the snow and they would follow the trickles of blood up and then go up another few feet and start digging because they knew there would be bodies under there. 96 died that March 1st. Many sit quietly buried in Everett, only a few with any reference to Wellington. I never had a grandfather and I've missed that. Linda Rancier's grandfather was conductor Joseph Pettit. Days before, Pettit guided several of the men through a treacherous walk across the snow and safely out of town. He came back to comfort his passengers and got caught in the avalanche. We're proud to think that, yes, he was a hero. He perhaps saved some lives. He also left a wife and seven children. Linda's father had to leave school at 13 to help support the family. I can remember my aunt talking about times where they had oatmeal for dinner and that was it <laughs> so you know there were hard times she still keeps the fragile tattered headlines from that day as the unofficial family historian it was just a part of our family it was a part of who we were the newspapers of the day screamed with headlines like tabloids some with wild stories and conflicting numbers well a lot of them said that dad had a vision in the night that woke him up and he used to always say that that was a lot of bunk that there was so much noise and lightning and thunder that nobody could sleep, so... <laughs> Dad never did have a favorable word to say for the P.I. <laughs> he always took the times. <laughs> After the avalanche disaster in Wellington in 1910, two diaries were recovered from the wreckage. One was a 16-page letter written home. The other was a letter, as well as notes, written on scraps of paper and napkins. The first came from 29-year-old Ned Topping, an Ohio salesman, who left his two-year-old son, Bill, back at home, and had also recently lost his wife in childbirth. The other came from 69-year-old Sarah Covington, who was on her way to Seattle for her golden wedding anniversary. Wednesday, February 23rd, 1910. Heavy snow is already falling in the Cascades, prefacing one of the worst winter storms ever. Such a snow you never saw. It's banked up to the top of the window here, and we can't come or go. Can't get any information as to when we'll get out. Ned Topping. A passenger and mail train coming from Spokane find their trip to Seattle stopped in Cascade the east end of the 10-year-old tunnel under Stevens Pass. February 23rd. We are snowed in at the mouth of the tunnel. 20 minutes of 11 a.m. The mountains are beautiful and we are all resting easy. They say we may be here all day. The cars are warm and very nice. Sarah Covington. Engines are steaming up and all this gives a faint hope. 
Just think, two whole days wasted. Nothing to do but eat, sleep, think, and read. That night, the train headed right up here, through the old Cascade Tunnel, a 2.6-mile stretch that goes straight into the town of Wellington. And fears of avalanche came within a few hours. As passengers found out, the cookhouse they ate in that very night at the other end of this tunnel was destroyed by an avalanche, killing two people. Now, they thought they were going to take them right on down to Seattle. I mean, they, these guys had been fighting snow for years. They thought that these trains would be in Seattle probably the next morning. Instead, the snow continues. Rotary crews work day and night clearing slides, but as soon as one was cleared, another one fell. Hard to find out when we'll move. Engines and rotary plows are nearly out of coal. Though I understand there's relief train on the way. It's very aggravating. By Thursday, the kitchen at the Bailitz Hotel had to start thinking of rationing the remaining food supply. The train was parked just west of the hotel, a place no one could ever remember, a slide occurring. Some are in deadly fear that another landslide will come down on us. We can hardly see the top of the mountain. They are so high. By Friday, then, Mother Nature began to take over. The, the rotaries that were out at Windy Point got trapped by slides. They actually had to park the rotaries out there, and the crews then walked back into Wellington. At one point, passengers signed a petition calling for the train to be moved back into the tunnel. But by now, slides blocked the way, and the wheels were iced to the rails. Friday night, nothing doing. Still in prison. Conductor thinks we might get out tomorrow. Saturday noon, still here, snowing hard. Report this morning that there's six miles of uncleared track. Some places 30 feet deep. They're working from Seattle toward us, and we may get out tonight, though I'm not believing anyone. A few men risked the steep slopes and neck-high snow to walk out of town. The rest were forced to wait. Sunday. A lady borrowed a phonograph, and we had some music, but people are getting very blue. Another said he dreamed he was in Seattle, and another said if he had that dream, he'd never want to wake up. And of course the porters and the conductors were assuring them everything was okay, but I think a lot of them realized that it wasn't. Six or eight men worked all day cleaning the snow from the top of the roundhouse. They said it was 13 feet at the west side of the tunnel. I can't send this yet, you know, but I will when the train goes. Monday night, still in this snow. If I ever get out of this place, how happy I'll be. And if nothing happens, I'll be free tomorrow. I'll have so much to tell you of my experiences when I get home. Oh, for a look at little Bill and you all. I'll be so, so happy. Those were the last words either of them wrote. At 1.30 in the morning on March 1st, the avalanche toppled both trains into the canyon below. 22 survived. 96 died, including Ned Topping and Sarah Covington. Of course, there were dozens of other sad stories in this accident, like 24-year-old Lee Ahern, who was on his very first trip out on the mail train, and 53-year-old Lewis Walker, who was a steward on the rail superintendent's private car. Since we first aired this series, we've received numerous phone calls. People have been telling us their family connections with Wellington. You know, it was just like it was a big, it was a big secret. Five pages of transcripted notes suddenly came to life for Pat Thomas. The story of Wellington was never talked about in her family, even though her mother was the granddaughter of Sarah Covington, the author of the diary on the train. She was four years old when this happened, and the only thing she remembers is that there was a lot of confusion at the, at the house. A lot of people came there, and that's all she remembers. The notes were transcribed from scraps of paper and envelopes Sarah had written on and were found in her purse. Pat knew she had the old notes, but didn't make the connection until she first saw our stories. I had really hadn't read them, and I really didn't realize that that uh, that she. I knew she was in the in the avalanche, but I didn't realize that that the that she was in the train and and she was one of the what was it 96 that were that were killed. Just down the tracks from Wellington was Madison, the town several passengers escaped to before the avalanche. Its name was soon changed to Scenic. Reuben Barrett was a telegrapher there, Bob Pyatt's grandfather. Every small town had a telegrapher or a telegraph operator, and they corresponded with the dispatcher, and in turn uh, physically passed out instructions to the trains as they went by. 
We identified some of his grandfather's pictures as Wellington, showing the old switchbacks and the site of the accident before the snowshed was built. As you can see from the day's time schedules, Wellington's name was quickly changed to Ty. This is something that was basically a, a well-kept secret in the days of the Great Northern Railroad and, and everyone else outside of the initial reports and, and other uh, summaries from uh, buffs and, and various historians. They kept it quiet because it certainly wasn't good for the railroad business in, in the days of uh, passenger service on the line. It's bringing history to life. The story of Wellington is finally beginning to find preservationists. Volunteers have worked since 1990 to build the Iron Goat Trail. Its most passionate promoter is Ruth Itner. She's coordinated the volunteer efforts since its inception in 1987. This grade was constructed between 1890 and 1893 when it was opened and it was abandoned this section was abandoned in 1929 when the new cascade tunnel was built it's the same path taken by trains in 1910 six miles of the trail have been completed and when finished it will connect with wellington over 900 volunteers that have worked on the trail thus far and it's taken um, over 20,000 hours in order to, uh, to reach the point where we have now. Volunteers are still needed to finish the rest of the route. They'll begin again next spring. The volunteers of the Iron Goat Trail hope to build right up to the accident site at Wellington. By 1999, they hope to have a memorial in place that will honor the 96 that died there. With that in place, the Cascades can finally wash away the thought that Wellington is Washington's long-forgotten disaster. I'm Perry Cooper. Thanks for joining us. Good night.